uncomfortable labels. Ravi, I assure you, it's as uncomfortable announcing the title of a talk as uh, the meaning. So it's very opposite, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, it's it's clearly something that uh, will be heard with great interest. And if therefore, uh, I had. Uh, here marked just about three minutes for me to speak as an introduction. Uh, beyond this, I really see no need to stand between you and the speaker. And therefore, I will request Ravi to uh, come on. Uh, 30 seconds to uh, inform all the participants that uh, there is a chat box here. You can start by putting, I mean, if you have any questions, you can put them on the chat and I will look at them. Um, and uh, those who do not wish to put it on the chat, you have the option also of raising your hand and, uh, and, and then coming in when the Q&A begins. Um, the, everybody will be muted for the duration of the talk so that we don't have um, interesting noises coming in from various quarters and focus completely on the speaker. Ravi, you have uh, 30 uh, minutes uh, to make your initial presentation so that we can have an equal amount of time uh, for the Q&A with five, 10 minutes to spare. Uh, because I assure you there will be, um, there will be many questions uh, once we have finished. So with that, I invite you to uh, begin your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alka Acharya. Thank you, Institute of Chinese Studies. It's an honor to give a talk on an issue which is dominating our newspapers in English as also in the vernacular languages. Let me begin briefly with the title, Two Uncomfortable Neighbors, Duo Incomoda Visinorum. My first aside beyond the talk, this uh, Latin word phraseology came because uh, I've been reading Asterix and Obelix comics where the pirate ship is always sunk and the old pirate when the ship sinks always says alia jecta est and that basically means the die has been cast. I thought that should be part of the title. I thought no, that would be quite juvenile. So anyway, came upon this thanks to Latin dictionaries available online. So now coming to the main topic. China and India, yes, we are two un uncomfortable neighbors as Westphalian states and also as civilizational expressions. Now the current Galwan River is an instance where it poses conundrum many and uh, it reveals bilateral inconsistencies as part of the very framework of what we call as a bilateral. And uh, China, in effect, is, I'm sorry to borrow another Latin phrase, they believe in effectus primatum uh, tenens, which basically means uh, the effect of primacy holding of territory. And till this Galvan fracas took place, it was not part of the negotiations between the two countries, but now it is part of the negotiations. So in other words, China has the upper hand there because it has included Galwan River as part of the negotiations. This leads me to a question, which river is going to be next? It is just a hypothesis, but maybe it could be the Satlej River. And because it flows from Kinod district and Himachal, and there have already been cases of uh, Chinese, the PLA there, entering Indian territory and then going back. Anyway, that apart, why has Galwan become so important to the Chinese? Now, we have several terminologies here line of actual control, line of control, international boundary or border. In effect, we do not have a firm boundary with our northern neighbor. And at an altitude of more than 4,500 meters, the Galwan River Valley stands at, uh, you could say, a particular bend where it flows into the Shiok River. 
and the Chinese have been very, you could say, calculated in targeting this particular tract, geographical tract, because of something which none of us have introspected further, our fault or limitations. This is in northwestern Ladakh, which is geophysically very important because mineral deposits there are rich in rare earths. And within that, it is a rich, there are rich ores of zirconium. Zirconium required for nuclear reactors to generate nuclear power. And these efforts by the Chinese coincided with our sadly domestic politics till August 15, 2019. Nothing was heard much about the Galwan River, the problems surrounding the river. But starting September, the Chinese made their first moves after Article 370 was uh, removed from the constitution. So in other words, there is a link between the domestic issues and also the international. It also operates on the other side. I'll come to that later. Now, bilateral tensions between the two countries have been ongoing even before 1962. And uh, Pangong So Lake is yet another aspect which we are reading about every day. And uh, this is uh, China's way of ensuring that it expands its physical territory, even territory that it does not control. And although we have accepted there's only one Tibet and that Tibet is China's Tibet, the fact remains that China is still uncomfortable with minorities holding huge geographical tracts. And this is where they have their domestic issues. As I said, I'll come to that later. Now, in uh, the case of the Galwan River, the whole valley, what has happened is that since September efforts were being made, there was feedback from the local residents there, which I'm um, sorry to say fell on deaf ears on our side. And uh, this perhaps encouraged the other side to realize that they can continue what they had been doing since the last decade plus, not just Galwan, but even other parts of Ladakh. Now, preparing for this uh, talk today, I decided to check the history of this particular region. And to begin with the name of the river, Galwan, it comes from Galwana in Kashmiri, which means uh, robber. I believe in history, robbers used to uh, pillage those parts. I don't know what was there, there to pillage, but at night they used to halt there. And hence it became, it became this stream was uh, started to be called Galvana. And it used to be a place which people used to avoid for most time of the year. And uh, since September when reports came in from the residents, of LAC, no action was taken because the, this particular part was being patrolled by the ITBP, which comes under the, under the Home Ministry. And uh, separately, what happened in Galwan should have raised concerns in New Delhi. It didn't happen till things exploded after 20 of our men were killed, unfortunately. And uh, a physical presence to China in these remote regions, geographically, apart from access to the rare earths and minerals, also gives them ingress into a particular part of Northwestern Ladakh, which could put pressure ultimately on uh, Siachen. Although geographically they're slightly distant, still they could put pressure on India in Siachen. And there are people more happy in another country, which I don't want to name, but which we all know, who are very happy that this pressure is being put on India. China also wants to hold the Galwan Valley, the river, 
in its entirety because if India has exclusive access to those parts, which it had, it could mean that we could interdict their communications when it comes to roads, to a road to Xinjiang. And uh, it is uh, basically a particular highway, highway number 219, which is 2,342 kilometers in length, constructed in, in the first decade of uh, after the uh, revolution succeeded in China. And uh, this highway also connects, uh, is, is, it is part of the China-Pakistan economic corridor for which the Chinese have invested close to around 12 and a half billion dollars. Now, to India, I look at it, I'm afraid to say quite critically, 1962 has been very decisive in our opinions regarding China, right or wrong. And uh, we have this 1962 phobia, which I'm afraid plays a very significant role in whatever decisions we take on China. Now, the Galwan Valley in 1962 this was, uh, it was uh, the PLA, they established a post there in 1962. And uh, this was a particular place called Samsung Ling. And uh, the talks between Chawalai and Jawaharlal Nehru at that time, they, it involved an exchange of maps. And the maps they exchanged, that what Chawalai gave Jawaharlal Nehru, it did not have Galwan as an area that China was claiming. And uh, India rejected China's claim line. That was in, of 1956. And uh, the Chinese claim line claimed the whole of Aksai Chit, which was ter a territory which they took over in 1962. And uh, then you had the Longchu and Konka Pass incidents, which led to the conflict in 1962 where we came off at the other end. Now, the interesting thing is a continuity in China's methodology, what I notice is irredentism, where this was noticed by politicians of India, beginning with the then Vice President Radhakrishnan and also the Home Minister Gobind Ballab Pant. And they were averse to Jawaharlal Nehru's discussions and overtures made to China regarding the boundary dispute. And uh, they felt that China had absolutely no claim historically or in any other way regarding Aksai Chin. And Chawanlai's visit to the Chinese was a disaster because he came from Burma, Myanmar now, and uh, because he had settled whatever disputes they had with Burma at that time, and that was considered to be a success, which they, called, they thought they could replicate with India. It wasn't. Now, these territorial re-alterations, no India. And uh, the only takeaway emerging out of Chawan Lai's talks was a setting up of a high power group which has continued for I don't know how many decades now, high power group or whatever group. And uh, it is this which to me reflects, I guess, a certain aspect of our democracy where, yes, these talks are secret, but the cabinet committee on security affairs, are they briefed about these talks? If so, then at least after around maybe two and a half decades, things should be made open. Now, China's approach, what I've noticed is first, international law is to be entirely ignored. India's uh, shortfall second are uh, with what I would say is, uh, sadly, the National Security Advisor not being part of the cabinet committee on security affairs. You have the prime minister, home minister, defense minister, finance minister, and the foreign minister. 
but the national security advisor is not even an invitee this perhaps needs to be corrected not after setting up on the committee but it has to be done right now also what i've noticed is that uh, china what i had said earlier internal agendas are also playing here why tibet tibet was people in tibet were quite enthusiastic about xi jinping becoming the general secretary of the communist party of china why because he of course is a princeling his father xi chungshun was in charge of tibetan affairs and was considered to be very mild and soft when it came to minorities and the 14th dalai lama who is still the dalai lama the current dalai lama in the 1950s he was so friendly with shi chungshun that he gave shi chungshun a rolex watch which uh, shi chungshun used to wear and which during the cultural revolution shi chungshun had to face the music that watch remained on his wrist and they felt the tibetans felt that this connection the shi chungshun and it should continue with his son sadly that is not the case other aspect is i don't know if there are people from the armed forces sitting here i hope they are what we have not introspected in detail are the very quiet changes which shi jinping has made when it comes to the pla the pla in tibet is a totally different division and it is a division which does not reply or respond or is accountable to the central military commission which means they have total freedom of operation and they only report to xi jinping the pla you could say is a faction within the communist party of china because after all china is a rare country perhaps the only country where the army belongs to the party not to the state now this is where i guess things go a bit awry because within china there are people who are complaining sai shi was a latest latest instance of people who are quietly complaining against the power appropriation done by xi jinping and there were factions within the party who have now been you could say sidelined to begin with it is uh, you have uh, uh, okay the pla has a major faction with uh, uh, financial interests and then you have the china communist youth league which has also been marginalized and the youth league earlier used to play a very important role so that leaders are identified early on and uh, this is where the chinese communist party was earlier facing factions or rather interest groups within the party but they've all been marginalized xi jinping also has this aspect where he knows he does not have any pla any experience with the pla that couldn't be said about tang xiaoping and of course it couldn't be said much about uh, chiang zemin also but still there is this aspect to china which we i guess need to examine more that there are strong domestic linkages to what is happening in galwan because to the to the pla the rare earths zirconium especially in galwan and thereabouts is money which uh, a friend sadly based in china in shanghai he had uh, written earlier that uh, this was a couple of years back that uh, it's time that the chinese communist party renamed itself as the chinese capitalist party and after laugh he told me that uh, close to 35 to 40% of the economy is owned by the party because then since we are old friends he told me over the several years that not just him to others that uh, there is a north south divide and the south wants progress with accountability and one gentleman 
wants progress minus accountability. He did not reveal the name, of course. We all know who that name is. And here, to China, in its grand plans for the world, maybe the ultimate eventual solution or other situation would be to have a Pax Seneca. Now, the only rival they have is India in Asia. And of course, they wouldn't want the Pax Indica to compete. Hence, marginalize India. Because what we have noticed, I mean, to especially me, I mean, what I've noticed is as a student, not only of China, but international relations, several aspects. First is our relations with our neighbors. They are not what they were earlier. Second is beginning with Turkey in Asia, China next, and uh, also you could say countries like, uh, say, Russia, Putin. These countries all have foreign policies where, surprisingly, personalities prevail over foreign policy. So it is like policy versus personality or personality over the policy. So this is an aspect which has struck me off late that why is this happening now? Even in countries who are established democracies, there could be an imprint of personalities on foreign policy decision making. And uh, in a country like ours, it does not make sense when contested issues on foreign policy are not discussed in forums where they ought to be discussed. Now, in China's case, China does not want India to even be cognized as an emerging power. It helps them that India has been an economic mess since the last few years. I say this strictly as a political agnostic. And they are watching us more closely from the reports on the Indian economy in Chinese newspapers. We know that they are studying us much more diligently than what we are doing with their economy. And uh, here, the question I have even as I'm giving this talk, is our foreign policy, where do we have to give primacy to bilateral relations or multilateral relations? Because when it comes to multilateral relations, multilateral institutions, we have uh, seen failure. Where is the non-aligned movement these days? Where is the Commonwealth heads of, Commonwealth heads of, group or whatever it is, Chogam, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Then you also have the SARC. All these multilateral institutions, if they do meet, they come out with very anodyne statements, which are not followed by any of the member countries. SCO, can China ever take action against its closest neighbor? With Pakistan, when it comes to terrorism, they won't. So what is our purpose of being an SEO? Just to be part of an anodyne statement again. So in that case, the current government has now become part of the Quad. The Quad means that uh, we also are uh, playing a little bit with our sovereignty because Quad means that uh, the other members of the Quad will seek access to our training facilities of the armed forces, which we are loath to. And if it is being done, well, it is better we don't know about it. Also, apart from the Quad, India is uh, in the bad books of China because we do not want to be part of the One Belt, One Road, Idairu, and uh, that is something which China has always been puzzled. And hence, we know how we have managed so far, but China's influence in countries like Sri Lanka, uh, the Maldives, Mauritius, even Madagascar, 
is much more than we have. Maldives, it has reduced a bit. But there it is because of the personal relations which their leaders have cultivated with some of our political personalities. Now, this is where the question I have again is, what about institutions of foreign policy? And this whole, that is why I put this uh, phrase there in Latin, because China and India are at that phase where 1962 was something which we can't get over. And this episode is where discussions are on. But pray may I know why in Moscow, mediators, they have uh, interests. What are those interests? Isn't it better to have a bilateral to discuss these issues? But I hope people are listening to me and us when the Q&A starts. But it is this aspect of foreign policy that puzzles me. But going back in time, it is like I realize that foreign policy, sadly, is a sphere which is dominated even within political parties by the very few and also the discussions. Foreign policy discussions are not deliberated by ordinary people. Should they, shouldn't they? I think they should because for instance, it calls me a digression. It galls me, appalls me, scares me when a student from Ladakh, staying very close to Aksai Chin, told me that uh, a girl student, when she, when she goes back for the vacation, she'll not be able to access the internet. I said, why? Sir, no electricity, no roads, no telecommunications. I said, no telecommunications? This age and time, this is 2020. Yes, sir. But I can access my cell phone because I have access to China Mobile. I said, what? Yes. So, I mean, what do I do with the, these tidbits? Have we failed? No, we haven't failed. It is that we don't care kind of an approach. This is stinging our options when it comes to discussing with China. And we may make loud noise about discussions held, the resolutions passed. Who's going to implement it? Second, what is the process of implementation? Are the people consulted? Places like Aksai Chin, where, uh, I mean, coming back to this uh, student, she's saying that the military has never visited her village. I couldn't believe it. Well, so be it, ITBP comes once in six months. If that is the state of affairs, then well, but it is not a question of their loyalty to India. They are, of course, Indian citizens. Otherwise, why should they be studying here? But the fact is, this is an occasion where we need to take a serious look at ourselves too, as to what are the options we have. Can we settle the boundary dispute? Or do we want to settle the boundary dispute? Do they want to settle the boundary dispute? I hope I'm wrong. I don't think even they want to settle the boundary dispute because a boundary dispute, keeping it alive means access to resources without accountability. Should we be headed that way? I don't think so. Now this whole issue, it also was aggravated by statements made by some of our, uh, you could say verbal polemics, beginning with the CDS. When the CDS said that if the military talks lead to a stalemate, India is prepared for the ultimate. Now, what is this statement all about? What is ultimate? Are we talking of war at a time when our economy has officially now, as they say, shrunk by 24.9% or 23.9% the GDP? Now, this is not an age when wars are to be fought. That is gone, that got over 70 years ago. This is an age where if a war is fought, it's going to be technological. 
and this also to me coincides with a time when we are demonstrating our e equipping ourselves with the finest weaponry that the world could offer to us and also the launch of a hypersonic rocket i mean these are messages being sent to the other side or rather to the northern side and the northwestern side now this has its own limits because ultimately the problem will fester talks will continue and are there any solutions if there are pray may i know what could these solutions be here a failure i accept as an academician is that one cannot hypothesize when it comes to a boundary solution with china if one were to hypothesize it will become very problematic for the simple reason the hypothesis also has to be based on material access material to be accessed would mean getting clearances clearances mean one comes to the attention of people and hence the research proposal or the hypothesis goes out of the window now ultimately the whole galwan issue to me was started by china ignored by us it festered we reacted because they kept on probing further and we finally have some of our troops positioned in the highest some of the highest parts of those mountains there in uh, absolutely you could say uh, in weather which is well minus 15 minus 16 now peak winters it goes down to minus 34 now are these soldiers prepared do they have kits i mean what is the supply chain what do they eat i mean are they rotated after every couple of months because a couple of uh, people i spoke to they said uh, the biggest shortfall we are facing is that people who go to high altitudes they return with uh, lifetime uh, you could say health complications and uh, we have to bear the expenses so on asking but why i mean aren't they trained and the simple explanation was that if somebody is taken from say a southern part of the country and with two weeks uh, acclimatization sent to somewhere near siachen glacier and then upwards to siachen glacier where it's minus 30 minus 35 and posted there for 6 months the person returns with uh, permanent disability not all but this is the situation now how do we handle this i have no answers i hope the q and a has more aids cues i think uh, someone by gave a, i mean he gave me an excuse there you have any questions you could direct it to him because then i could dwell on it work on it and return to you with those answers and uh, here i do not want to spend extra time because otherwise uh, it would be verbal torture so i will stop here leaving you more confused just like how i am when it comes to this galwan issue and uh, the notes i have are notes which i just jotted down and just printed so that i don't lose track yeah so that is where we are and uh, well since the spirit of times to me is uh, usage of yeah latin phrases i uh, all that i want to say is alia jecta est so questions are yours now thank you very much okay um thanks ravi that was uh, that was that was quite a comprehensive uh, broad based uh, discussion of uh, Uh, really quite a large number of issues uh, you brought into this uh, this this framework of the uncomfortable neighbors and uh, i mean really i'm not trying to i mean there's, there's no there's no need for me to sum it up uh, i think uh, the key takeaway here for me personally was that uh, 
there are domestic issues which are obviously raging within China, within the party. That's producing its own pressures. Uh, so that's one set of issues, uh, which is making our neighbor uncomfortable to a certain extent. Um, and the other external on the external front, it does not want a neighbor that is going to be a challenge to it. Um, India is in China's bad books, uh, is the phrase that you used. So clearly the discomfort is arising uh, both from the internal pressures as well as, and, and I think that could easily uh, apply in the Indian case also. And uh, so that, 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 that the impasse has, has, uh, has led us to an impasse. Okay, so I'm now going to open up the floor to uh, questions. Uh, um, so far the, the chat has not, uh, well, there's uh, Ambassador Saurabh Kumar who has said that he has to leave. And um, if he uh, he's requested to ask it, please. So I think I will give the floor to Ambassador Saurabh Kumar. Please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Speaker. I am sorry to have been able to listen to you without, uh, with some interruptions, but <clears throat> I could gather very good observations. I want to ask you about your remarks on the PLA, the relationship of the PLA to the decision in the decision making system. I have the same hunch very much uh, that you mentioned. It is uh, uh, virtually a law unto itself. Uh, they don't have the theory of a liberal system of being subordinate, it belongs to the party and all that, we know. So what would be your um, things pertinent to our situation right now, you know, drawing from that? I want to mention one um, aspect, uh, you, it may have caught your attention. After Galwan, it was the PLA which first put out the claim that the sovereignty of Galwan, that was the term used, has always belonged to China. It's a little odd term, sovereignty over Galwan. We don't normally talk of sovereignty over Galwan. And the foreign There's some disturbance in the audio. We can't... Uh, yes. You can hear your question, Ambassador. Sorry, no, I cannot hear. Unmute. Yes, Maybe I'm, is it better now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Now. yes. Maybe I'm a bit far away. I was saying, I uh, complimenting you on your remarks regarding the PLA, which I think uh, where I am too, they do seem to be a law unto themselves. And you have put very pertinent observation about Tibet PLA being uh, in a special category altogether. <clears throat> within a broad understanding, they have a lot of freedom. I was asking you, what would be your uh, more specific takes drawing from that with reference to our situation? So what are the implications in your view of our really having, uh, having that freedom? And I mentioned one point I would like to mention in that context. I noticed after Galwan, it was the PLA spokesperson who first put out the claim that the sovereignty over Galwan, they use this term, has always belonged to China. And the foreign ministry repeated it a day or two later. 17th and 19th June, if I'm not mistaken, are the dates. And that itself is odd. To make the claim, uh, the PA, for the PLA to make the claim, and even the use of the terms are a bit odd, sovereignty over Galwan Valley. We don't have sovereignty over specific areas. Sovereignty is a concept applies to the whole thing. And there are other indications from time to time. It's not only this. So I, I don't want to, you know, I want you to please, since you've given thought to it, you noted it. So what would be your take on um, uh, other uh, uh, you know, uh, aspects? On this? What other things could be drawing from the PNA? from its independence or from its freedom of action. Ravi, I think you can take that on so that if yes. uh, 
uh, <clears throat> then at least you will have addressed this query. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador. Wonderful question. And let me, I mean, I've been a student of political science, so let me try to answer sovereignty first. I think we need to stimulate discussion when it comes to when China makes such flawed, fake claims as to what does China mean by sovereignty? I would break it up further. Cultural sovereignty, historical sovereignty, geographical sovereignty. There are so many aspects of sovereignty. Now, if the Chinese bring out a Tang Dynasty manuscript saying that sovereignty was there at that time, one could uh, retort and say that sovereignty came became an issue only after the Treaty of Westphalia. And one could counter them very easily because if these parts were part of China, how come they did not claim these parts even in 1962? And uh, secondly, the PLA, decision-making and China. PLA is, of course, a very significant part of decision-making in China and all infrastructure towards what they call are the margins are decided by the PLA. And of course, the contracts and the subcontracts go to the PLA. And uh, the PLA plays a very important role with their system of education, universities, et cetera, et cetera. And Xi Jinping is somebody with whom they could play a bet because ultimately, even if it is the army of the party, they still have the arms and ammunition. And Xi Jinping needs the support of the PLA so that he can be as he wants to be the next Mao. And he requires the PLA faction, if it is a faction now, to be part of his, you could say, spine. Because apart from the China Communist Youth League, Xi Jinping has also marginalized the United Front Work Department, which was another powerful faction. He's also sidelined the Shanghai faction. And Xi Jinping that way is somebody who wants power, power, and more power. So this is where uh, the PLA is also playing their own game so that they could expand their influence further. Typical of, uh, you would say, one party systems. Sadly, China to me is not a country, it's a civilization. But when that civilization is run by a single party, what we see is what we have, period. Thank you, Ambassador. Okay. Uh, Thank you, but I'm sorry, one person. It's, uh, more specifically on things, how does it have a bearing on, on, you see, like these decisions or these actions, our interest is how far is Xi Jinping in the know? Overall, yes, of course, it can't be without his consent. But now it's a question of specifics when you go to things. So would you say, for example, would you go to the extent of saying that things are done without specifically taking his consent, especially this action now yesterday? See, we have to, we have to, I'd, I'd encourage you to move in that direction. It's a plausible thing, but we have to look for science. We have to piece together. And, uh, you know, that, that, uh, yes, Ambassador. during the time of Doklam, you know, the personal uh, links and um, yeah, Ravi, go ahead. it's the same in South China Sea. Again, everywhere that the PLA decides to give expression to national assertion, the party, even let alone Xi Jinping, the party cannot hold them back on the nationalist question. So an aggressive posture in the South China Sea, vis a -vis Taiwan, Senkaku, all of it can be explained by this basic, you know, reading of the PNU. So would you go along it with that? It makes sense rationally to take on. Yeah, I suggest you answer the question, please. Thank you. Yes, that is what I was trying to say, that the PLA is intrinsic to what the Communist Party of China is. The question is, is it vice versa? 
does the PLA comes first and the CPC next or the other way around? And maybe these days, it could be that because we assume Xi Jinping is all powerful, he is. But he has to make concessions so that he's not removed using within party mechanisms if there are, which is why people talk of Xi Jinping. Nobody talks of Li Chaoxing, who seems to be a more amenable person more in the slightly old world tradition of uh, Churungji kinds. And that has changed with Xi Jinping, where he dominates and he was very well in the know what was happening when he was in India last year, when he was in Mahabalipuram. That was when the Chinese began making their moves. Initially, one thought it is without Xi Jinping knowing, but that is not the case. He, of course, is in the know. Maybe not the exact details, but without his nod, the troops couldn't go over the LAC into what is Indian side of the LAC. And this is to coerce India, not convince or pressurize, coerce India into settling the boundary dispute on their terms. Because as I had said earlier, they do not believe in international law. If there is international law, it will be international law with Chinese characteristics. And we sh should not be prepared for that. And even international law, there are various aspects of international law which people could challenge me. International law does not frown upon territory that has been captured during an act of war. It says nothing about it, that it should revert back to the country from where it was seized or taken or whatever. International law is silent on those aspects. Now, India shouldn't be part of all these because ultimately it is a bilateral and we have to settle the issue if we want it to be settled. It's the same also on the other side. Yes, I'll stop here, Ambassador. Okay, uh, thanks, Ravi. Now, uh, I am going to uh, ask our uh, host, um, he's generally doing all the management all the time and uh, uh, scholar in his own right and he rarely gets to come in. So someone where I think uh, uh, you should come in and uh, put your question forward and then I'll take the list as they come on the chat. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so my question is with regard to the mention you made of the quad and you mentioned about how that might affect our maybe perceived sovereignty. And you refer to uh, other countries using our training establishments or even, say, military bases of our own. Now, um, that kind of relationship, one could argue, is a natural byproduct of any collaboration that we may use their training establishments and their military bases, and they do the same with us. So uh, are you arguing for less of a collaborative approach to maybe countering China in the military sphere? Uh, or how do you see us balancing the issue of sovereignty and something that is required in a give and take relationship with these other countries? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Samanway. Very thoughtful question. To me, if you do ask, I link it to our current foreign policy, which is. Uh, non-aligned movement phase two and very reactive because for several years we were very low pro when it came to the quad and suddenly we are overactive when it comes to i mean since what has happened with china or what is happening even as we are talking right now and uh, when it comes to bases yes because once you have troops from the other countries in bases in our country, it actually, if you look at it, it could be seen in a very conservative view as a violation of our sovereignty. But if it is an agreement between two countries or four countries, then that could be seen for training facilities or whatever. 
but that would perhaps be the first time when officially you have foreign troops in the country, which could be a short-term insurance to be taken. But India is too big a country, vast, and of course complicated to be amenable to this kind of a construct if it happens. Why? Because of the leaders in the other countries, which is why I had hinted earlier about uh, personalities and foreign policy. United States, for instance, their foreign policy in the last couple of years has uh, completely been dominated by a personality who's been using his family. Now, if he leaves office or he loses elections, whoever comes next, will that person honor agreements agreed by the current gentleman and our side? Maybe, maybe not. So there is no certainty, which is why I said that maybe our foreign policy is non-aligned movement phase two. And there a personality plays a role because non-aligned movement was, uh, I mean, the construct of three personalities. And uh, Joseph Gauz Tito, Jamal Abdel Nasser, and Jawaharlal Nehru. And our foreign policy, I guess, for very many years was faithfully abiding by the tenets of NAM. But uh, that has, the world has changed. After the Cold War, non-aligned movement lost steam. Rather, the, the raison d'etre. But now we have a phase where institutions perhaps react because personalities are deciding. At the same time, when personalities decide, there should be consolidation mechanisms. If we are a democracy, I fail to understand why are we falling short in explaining the finer nuances of our foreign policy to scholars who are working on different areas, not just international relations, where people who are working, say, political science or geography. Why are we so hesitant in parting with information which is available in the open domain? So this is where I believe that uh, collaboration could work, but in the short time, because we are, we are becoming dependent with the lead player in the Quad, the United States. And the United States is uh, getting its bit of the bargain. Otherwise, before we decided on the Quad, where were the Hercules aircraft, Apache helicopters? So the U.S. arms industry is happy with the Quad. So it is financial interests that matter, which is where I said collaboration with Biased NAM, Non-Aligned Movement Phase 2, is a very talks with uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi being held in Moxo, Moscow. Of course, the Russians would want to sell something to us. Maybe their latest rockets or anti-missile systems or whatever. So even the mediator has a stake there. And these stakes have to do with arms and ammunition, which to me reflects our limitations and our own abilities to create an arms industry. Samanbhai, I'm sorry, I'll have to stop here because others may be asking questions and whatever queries you have, shoot a, oh, I'm sorry, I mean, send a question to me. I mean, I want to say shoot a question towards me, but. Uh, sure, sure, yourself. thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, now uh, in the chat uh, uh, box, I see uh, as you were uh, giving your talk, Ravi, uh, Unam had put in a kind of a question, uh, come comment, uh, whether Galvan was named after the person who guided, um, found the way beyond the valley for the English team. And so uh, you had a different explanation for Galvan, so she's merely putting it out as kind of a clarification which you may want to address. And uh, then there is also um, uh, 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 an intervention by Colonel Verma to your point about uh, 
uh, acclimatization of the troops and whether they had suitable. Uh, so if uh, Colonel Verma would like to make his point uh, or uh, if, he, if he wishes to make his point, uh, Colonel Verma, you're welcome. You unmute yourself, Colonel. No, you are still muted. Yeah. No, you are still un still muted, Colonel. You have to click on the mic icon. No, you are, we can't hear you. Maybe it's like old, old days. Yeah. Rukawat may hear. Uh, Colonel Verma, you'll have to click on the mic icon. We can't hear you. You are muted. So we can't hear your, uh, your intervention. Someone, is there any way you can uh, help him out there? In the meantime, I will go across to the next question. Basically, uh, what Colonel Verma was saying was that uh, with regard to the whole uh, business of acclimatization, um, the ration of the units and the personnel, clothing, suitable rations, um, all that before the platoon moves on to the higher altitudes, uh, the, this kind of process is very strictly followed. So uh, your worries on that score, I think he was trying to uh, to address. And then yet another question, yeah. which came who has asked that. Um, this uh, yeah. is about whether you think that the Chinese have deliberately picked this particular timing, um, Galwan, Pankongso areas. Uh, is there anything about the timing that you think ha is particularly notable? And one more question, you please take all these and then we'll see if there are others left. This one question from Nazar. Uh, Nazar Khan, he's asking, uh, why do you think, let me rephrase it as, do you think China is a single civilization when you said China is a civilization? So do you think that? And if, that, if so, why do you think China is a single civilization? So I guess you can take these on. Yes. Uh, I'll try, I'll try. Okay, we'll come back to him later. Yeah. I'll try to answer Colonel Verma's question regarding clothing uh, and equipment. Primary evidence is uh, the my last visit to Ladakh was in 2015, and uh, it was the month of February. And the weather was uh, very mild, minus 18 degrees. And the soldiers were wearing tennis shoes, minus 18 degrees in Choglamsa, wearing tennis shoes. So pleasantries exchanged. And then saying that, don't you feel cold? And the response is, we have other ways of keeping warm. And then a flask was shown. I didn't ask anything further. And I leave it at that. And also the equipment seemed quite old. I mean, AK-47. I mean, maybe they needed better equipment. I'm not a gun kind of a person. I don't know much. Now, second question, did China do this deliberately? I would say yes. Not because of uh, the discourse which one is exposed to these days, but this has been a plan for quite some time, irrespective of whoever is at the helm on the side. Because they feel that India can be pressurized into settling the boundary dispute on their terms. And that can only happen if they keep encroaching on our territory. We have not yet confirmed, but the fact remains that even before the current government came, during the earlier government's time, the decade that they were there, it seems China gobbled up around a couple of thousand square kilometers of land. And either we knew about it and kept quiet about it, 
or we decided that we'd better keep quiet about it because we cannot retaliate because uh, they will never get over what happened in 1962 when they were at the helm of affairs. Hence, I think a calculated decision making is operating in China where India is shown its place that India should not become too ambitious. And this also coincides with loud statements that we will become Asia's second largest economy by 2024 or 2025, $5 trillion economy, which means India becoming a larger economy than Japan. Now that is something which China cannot accept because that would mean that that will be at the expense of China. Then this wonderful question on civilization, right you are. I said once China has a civilization, but there are many civilizations or rather expressions of civilization. People in Southern China, the Chinese they speak tone wise is closer to Vietnamese. And uh, the Chinese which is spoken in Northeast China is different from the one spoken in Beijing and even right up to Hubei. And uh, people in Shanghai are to me very different. Of course, they're Chinese. People one knows are members of the party, but the manner in which they criticize the party is remarkable because they say that uh, some of them said, this is open workshops saying that uh, we have discussed whether the other party would have been a better choice. So it's like, I mean, as a foreigner, one is stunned when a Chinese person, a member of the party says the other party would have been a better choice. And then asking a friend later, why? Saying that read our history, you'll know. And then you come to realize the history of a city like Shanghai. And Shanghainese are, I don't know about the current generation, but the older generation, they are upset that Hong Kong became Hong Kong because not only because of the British, but it was Shanghai's wealth which went there and created Hong Kong what it is right now. And to them, Hong Kong is nothing but a big fishing village. So that is the feeling which some people in Shanghai have. These are members of the party. And uh, it is this expression of China which one looks forward to, which Xi Jinping has squelched. Because he, this is the real, I mean, the truth is that he is officially clamping down on Tibet. But it seems privately, he is doing it in a subtle way because Hung Liyuan, his spouse, is said to be a Tibetan, a Tibetan Buddhist, and uh, practices Buddhism at home. But if Xi Jinping was to disclose it, or was she to disclose it, well, he'll be looking for a job after that, a new job. So this is China, where China has, I mean, one has to look at it as a very colorful spectrum. We are held hostage by a discourse these days, especially in the media, where it is the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, that's it. Wang Yi talks were held and they encroached on our land, which is acknowledging that encroachment has taken place, yes. And then it becomes a negotiation point when it should never have been negotiated. What is our land is our land. Don't we have it in us to tell them that this is not part of the negotiations ever? That is where we are losing the plot. It will be those elements of, uh, you could say, sorry to use this adjective, slipshod. This slipshod manner of discussing issues with China is what gives them the advantage. Yes, I hope I've answered the questions. Okay. Uh, yes. So, Rija, Rija here has a question. Rija, will you come in?
Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you that uh, Dr. Happy Mo Jacob, in a recent article in the Hindu, has argued that India's defense expenditure will take a backseat due to economic slowdown and COVID uh, and its impact on the economy, and that the China threat won't make a difference. So, uh, what is your take on the issue? I think uh, I did read Happy Moon's uh, article, Honest Confession. Happy Moon is a friend, and uh, I didn't find anything ob objectionable to what he said because that is a reality. There will be a decline in uh, our outlay when it comes to defense equipment for the simple reason that our economy has shrunk, and uh, economists who move beyond uh, statistics, they say that it'll take at least a decade before things come back to normal. What is normal is that we should reach a stage of 6.3% growth a decade. This is 2020. And uh, here I would agree entirely with uh, Happy Moon. And I think he had mentioned the article about uh, aspects where it came to policy making. He's very right because when it comes to China, I have not come across even colleagues whom I know who during this phase have been approached by authorities in the government asking for what exactly are the Chinese up to? And it is as if, if people behave in a manner of decision making as if they know everything and what the answer is, we are the ones who lose. And in any case, we have also already lost some territory which has been acknowledged, but not in parliament. And uh, there is no harm in convening parliament even digitally and discuss the issues so that one hears what exactly is happening, has happened, and who were responsible. And issues like if, heavens forbid, if there is an extreme situation like what the CDS has said, who may I know will take the decision? Will it be the CDS? Will it be the chief of army staff? Will it be the battalion commander there the, or the brigadier? There is no way of knowing. Are we creating yet another line or rather circle in the bureaucratic chain where you have the CDS, you have the national security advisor, you have the chief of army staff? I mean, what is this? Then you have the national security council secretariat. I mean, if there's an emergency, who decides? Is it a secret? to reveal who decides. Ultimately, we know the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, the President of India. Yes. But when it comes to the field... Yeah, sorry, sir. Yeah, so this, I hope, we take it as an occasion where not only do we constructively deal with China and at the negotiating table, not in Moscow, preferably in New Delhi or uh, Beijing, the capitals, or any other city for that matter, or for real effect, maybe Galwan Valley itself, why not? Show them how we are prepared. There's nothing wrong in it. And uh, we need to also convince our media not to go overboard because the media loves a good story. This is not a story. This is a tragic instance of how decisions have, are being taken on a minute by minute basis and where institutions are conveniently ignored. And okay. here I'm in agreement with Happy Moon with whatever he has written in that article. Yes. Okay, sorry to cut short. We've got now the next, uh, within, we have to wrap up within the next five minutes. Uh, I see that one question which has come in from YouTube, uh, which says, uh, uh, 
about what impact will Indo-US naval exercises in the South China Sea have on the border conflict India has with China? So that's one question. There was one clarification which was sought by uh, uh, Ananta Kumar Giri. He wanted to know what was the name of the other Chinese leader you mentioned. Um, um, maybe you were talking about the defense person or whatever. I, I, I don't know. He just said other Chinese leader. So if you can just recall the names. And finally, there's a longish comment um, from Devendra Kumar, which is basically um, uh, commend, commending your comprehensive talk. Uh, but he also wants to know whether uh, uh, issues of ter territorial sovereignty and challenges uh, that uh, are faced um, by China are a major challenge to its rise. And therefore, while uh, you link its actions to immediate domestic tensions and leadership uh, issues, such actions are likely to continue in the long term. Uh, he has a question mark at the end, so maybe he wants to know whether this is a long-term kind of a thing that we are seeing that has begun in China. And uh, so you can take that in as well. And um, Ritter was basically um, putting a point um, now that we don't have much time. Let me put across his question to you, uh, Ritter, on your behalf. He's saying that uh, civilians in Arunachal Pradesh are being asked to stay prepared for Chinese aggression, which may occur anytime soon. And therefore, we should really be also putting some attention to that um, instead of just talking about Indian foreign policy, um, which is uh, well, a point of view. So if you can address all these issues in the next two and a half minutes, Ravi, we will be very grateful. Yes, to Ambassador Giri, the first, uh, I mean, the person I mentioned was Li Chaoxing, the former foreign minister, he's from Shantong, and he heads a group, a faction within the Communist Party of China, who are opposed to Xi Jinping, but doing it very subtly, typical Chinese style. Uh, the other question which was asked was, uh, uh, Chair, it escapes me. The impact of Indo-US naval exercises in if, the South China Sea. I think for the moment, India should not conduct exercises in the South China Sea with the United States. Why? Because that will aggravate the situation in our Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. And of course, the Bay of Bengal because China is stitching up naval agreements with Myanmar and also they have conducted preliminary talks with Bangladesh. So for the moment, yes, if they conduct exercises in the Arabian Sea within India's maritime territorial limits, fair enough. International waters, that is for the people to decide. And uh, South China Sea, I think in India should stay away from that because that will only aggravate the situation further. It will be, it will, it could, it could score brownie points for people who seek to benefit from it. But it is short term because, as I had said earlier in my talk, foreign policy is not an issue to 99.9% .9 of people in India. It is only people like us who follow foreign policy very rigorously. Yes. Any other question, uh, Chair Professor Acharya? Uh, do, you, do you see this, uh, Devendra Kumar was saying that, do you see this if it is, if we are talking in terms of domestic issues and then the issue of territorial sovereignty um, as China is rising? Um, and then the question of leadership, you think that this kind of a stance that China has taken is likely to adhere in the near to uh, medium to long term? I think so, because in China, let's face it, yes, it's a one party state, but foreign policy is debated with, of course, a strong party slant. We, as the world's largest democracy, we just have to go through the election manifestos during just before the general elections. And where does foreign policy come in? Usually it'd be one paragraph. I mean, 
sometimes i get this feeling that it is written by one person but given to several parties india follows a foreign policy of continuity perseverance blah 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 which says nothing just verbose and that is where i guess we need more discussion on foreign policy and here that has to be done by the vernacular not just media vernacular journals where people actually discuss why do we have these problems for several decades and question which i did not raise is that we are in the quad yes but in the quad there are two candidates who are democracies japan and india we are two outstanding democracies who have territorial disputes with all our neighbors in japan's case maritime with the soviet union i mean with russia with uh, korea south korea and of course they have that way even north korea uh, with taiwan and just about with everyone there and uh, japan and russia they are still in a state of war although they've not brought closure to it shinzo abe wanted to well he's left office india we have territorial disputes with all our neighbors except sri lanka we used to have maritime territorial disputes with sri lanka with a small island called kachatiwo and uh, that island has now been settled in the sense the fishermen can go and fish during particular seasons so this season if indian fishermen go next season we need a sri lankan uh, fishermen that has been settled but otherwise with all our neighbors beginning with our favorite neighbor pakistan and uh, china of course nepal uh, and uh, myanmar bangladesh with all our neighbors we have problems except bhutan and so how long can this continue yes okay so ravi maybe in conclusion just one uh, 30 second kind of a thing rita was saying that storm clouds of war are gathering and uh, and and how do you how do you look at the foreseeable future uh, uh, in the context of that looming shadow of war and uh, the uncomfortable neighbors are going about to get more un- uh, more uncomfortable as far as uh, the sense of this question is yes <clears throat> i hope there is no conflict if there is a conflict it's going to harm both the sides and when it harms both the sides it should not lead to escalation escalation could mean in which a way one could think it could be escalated i do not think both the sides would wish to escalate this should be seen as an opportunity where they need to have open talks where there is no harm in india putting forward the proposal let us let us have comprehensive talks on every issue between the two and seize initiative so that they cannot back out of it because replying to it should be either positive or negative not replying goes against them and do not have any mediators if the two countries have talks please do not have it in moscow or beirut or any of these places have it in both the countries and have a time frame otherwise it will continue like the jwg decades and uh, scholars who are working on china we do not know exactly what was discussed but the report submitted to parliament if it is in parliament if somebody like me was to go and ask then well people come to my house asking why why are you so interested in china these are state secrets and if you publish anything that's a violation of official secrets act so basically one freezes so this is what can we this is an opportunity to me where the current government with its absolute majority in parliament can make a decision saying that let us comprehensively discuss whatever difficulties we have we are neighbors 
we are civilizations. And here I have to conclude by quoting a Chinese scholar, Hu Shi. Hu Shi was a Chinese scholar who initially was a member of the Communist Party of China in the 1920s. When he realized that somebody like Mao Zedong is emerging as the center of the party, this is going to be a party run by a personality. He walked over to the Kuomintang, the KMT, and Chiang Kai-shek welcomed him, did not get him executed or any such thing, because Hu Shi was an intellectual, and Hu Shi, Hu Shi advised Chiang Kai-shek, and finally when the KMT lost the civil war, he was with Chiang Kai-shek, they sailed in the same boat to Taiwan and Chiang Kai-shek appointed him as the person to establish the Academia Sinica. Academia Sinica is today the world's best repository of literary material on China. And who well, should Robert, establish it? Uh, I think I think said, uh, I'll end here, uh, Alka, ma'am. I'll end here. Yeah. Hu Shi, in 1962, when he was asked in the Republic of China then, what do you think about this conflict India and China have had in 1962? He said, for two millennia plus, India never sent a person wearing a uniform over the mountains. India exported Buddhism, cultural traits to China. And what has China done? They have exported, they have exported men wearing uniform with arms and ammunition. Answer over from Hu Shi. That's it. So that okay. tells in very many ways where our relations are. Yes. Well, on that note, I think we'll just have to immediately bring this. We've overshot our time, but Ravi, uh, on the note of uh, uh, the importance of uh, academic and scholarly cogitation on this issue, um, uh, well taken point, and I think we need to continue our discussion and dialogue. And as to the, uh, the situation uh, between the governments, and uh, we can only hope that... Uh, the caution that has been so far demonstrated on both sides, uh, particularly uh, we heard the foreign minister speaking uh, just a couple of days ago, talking about the importance of the diplomatic uh, process and the need to uh, resolve this diplomatically. So we hope that spirit is animating the talks that uh, are taking place between him and the Chinese foreign minister. And that uh, this uh, dread of the unthinkable um, should uh, should ease up soon. It's not a very good feeling to live in that uh, your biggest neighbor and one with whom you've had centuries of collaborations and interaction uh, are poised uh, is poised as 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 the enemy at this point. So I think uh, on those kinds of notes and uh, aspirations and hopes and wishes, let me thank you, Ravi, very uh, once again for. Uh, very comprehensive lecture raising a whole lot of issues and questions and thank you for the audience uh, questions and uh, comments and I hope I have addressed everybody's uh, comments uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again uh, at the next Wednesday webinar. Thank you. <laughs>